So why is it so important to let go of negative thought patterns? And I'd have to say simply because it comes down to this. Thinking creates your reality, your personal reality is altered. People that fixate on negative thoughts, I hope that doesn't happen now. I know you're going to cheat on me. Well, you bring it about. I know that I'm going to lose altitude awareness on this one. And then they, they open the very low. It's called the law of attraction. And as far as I can tell, it's the truth. What we repeat in our minds over and over and over again has a neuroplastic effect just like meditating does. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm not any good at that. I'm not smart. These affirmations echo in our brains and they create who we are. Which means that we can change it by repeating something different. It's very simple. I've noticed a phenomenon in the skydiving world. If there's a field of grass with one tree in it, a scared skydiver is going to hit it. It's amazing. I mean, there's, there's this. I used to live in Zephyr Hills, Florida. It's one of the meccas of skydiving. It's near Tampa. I used to live there. And there's one stand of trees, and it has parachute line burns all over it. It's incredible. They fixate on what they don't want to do, and they can't take their eye off it. I know I'm going to fail, and the failure happens. This is why I teach transcending fear because it's so pivotal for people's lives. If you can get away from fixating on what makes you feel like crap and focus on your solution, life can change. Our focus of attention is very simple, right? We have the ability to shift it. That's what creates our emotional experience. Focusing on the object of our fear will increase the magnitude of the fear response. And that promotes negative thought patterns. We fixate on the object of the fear, worst case scenario, trips going on. I bounced once. I crashed into the ground so hard that the doctors were shocked that I lived based on the damage in my body. Uh, it was a collapse. My parachute folded up. And of course, it's why I ended up going to parachute design to try to solve the problem. But in the first year after my, after my recovery, after I got out of the wheelchair, after I got off the crutches, after I got off the cane, after I got out of the PT and got myself strong enough and finally started jumping, I found the image of my worst case scenario, that, that ground rushing up, repeating in my mind. And it turns out that emotion connects to memory, that they're not separate things. As a matter of fact, emotion is what empowers memory. It's what lights it up, what dog ears the page in our consciousness. And the more emotion you have associated with the context, the more it becomes a long-term memory. This is why trauma is so hard to get rid of. And so we need to you know, kind of recognize when we've got these things and take it on. You're scared of heights because something bad happens? Do things that aren't as scary but are, you know, involve heights a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to be boxed in the rest of your life. And that's not fun. Because there are a lot of fun things you can do up on I find that when I'm in a negative state of mind, all I do is look for danger. My mind is on this seek mode of, well, how is it going to go bad? How is, uh, how is this going to turn out to be horrible? And as a result, I find myself unable to soothe myself. So then the alternative comes in. So a lot of new 80s stuff about positive thinking out there. Positive thinking, I think it comes down to this. When you're in a situation that doesn't look good and there's no cue in your environment that says that things are going to change, that things are going to get better, that they're going to turn a corner, out of nowhere, you have the ability to consider the possibility that things are going to go well, that everything's actually going to be all right. Where did that come from? Is it your knowledge of who you you are based on who you've been? Maybe. Maybe. Or it could just be your decision to always consider the possibility that everything's going to be all right. That's where self-soothing comes from, I think. That's the the big cognition that goes, all right, okay, maybe I've been making a case for the worst-case scenario, building it up in my mind. It's something that Richard Bach once said that I really like. Argue for your limitations, and you get to keep them. I like that one. 
So positive visualization is also a big piece of this. We have to envision the specific steps, the ways to create the best case scenario. You know, we disengage from the ne negative trip, we calm ourselves down first so that we can see those possibilities, and then we see what do I have to do to solve this problem? What's the way? You focus your mind on anything else, and you're just making it worse. There's always some sort of a solution, even if it means just escape. And that brings us to what I would call the opposite of the fear state. Human consciousness has a full spectrum of possibilities, and one of them is the ultimate contracted state of who you are, where you're not allowing yourself to really uh, expand and grow and learn and, and be the best that you can be. The other side is the flow state. Six and Mahali, have you guys ever read Flow? The Psychology of Optimal Experience? Great book, a little thick. You don't have to read the whole thing, you'll get to just, I'll give you the clip notes. So it's a state of meditation and motion. When you're taking a test and you know the answers and you're just like, oh, I got this one, oh, I got this one, right? You feel kind of a flow through that experience. When you're swimming and you're in kind of a nice rhythmic mode or you're jogging or a concert pianist that knows that piece, you know, with every fiber of their being, they sit down and their ego is dissolved. While they're doing it, they are the task there's no separation between who they are and, and the unfolding, the perfect unfolding of this. The best case scenario is already done. Because they walk into it knowing what it feels like to succeed in that specific thing. Because they can picture it, they can feel it. This is where we see our optimal performance. Obviously, we're focused now. That's what's creating it on the best case. And we're completely absorbed in the moment and time slips away. Which is why Scott Evers have audible altimeters. Why you have clocks in the walls to detect. <laughs> you don't uh, lose track of time in that. But when we're, we're in these really hyper-focused states, we can really lose track of time. It's interesting. And in my experience is when we're in a heightened flow state, a really joyful flow state where you know what you're doing and you're surrendering to the experience and you're allowing yourself to become sort of simple in that moment, there's no room for fear. There's no space in your, in your head for that at all. So things like yoga, meditation, contemplative walking, these things can help us to build the space in our consciousness for that experience. That we can learn what it's like to be in a flow state. And then we can apply that to other things in our lives. But I know that there's a lot of people walking around this earth that have never really experienced the flow state. So I say, go to something simple. Go do, go do a yoga class. You know, something that involves flow and notice what that's like. Because this whole transcending fear trip that I'm on is not about avoiding fear. It's about creating the opposite. So ultimately, here's how I have found the answer to dealing with fear. Step one, calm your body down. Slow down. Don't use it. Slow down. Step two is draw your attention away from what's scaring you for a moment. Focus on empty-headedness or something that makes you feel good. And focus on that feeling so that you can start to kind of sober up from the bad feeling into the good feeling because that's where good stuff comes from. And then, of course, then we have to allow ourselves to surrender. Do what you got to do to get through that situation. What's next? What's next? What's next? That's the flow state. And then, when the flow gets too fast and you get out of control and you start to feel your pains in a bunch of you again, repeat. Right? Return to step one. We have to change from feeling like a victim, you know, the passenger in the back seat, that when the bumps in the airplane start shaking in and you tighten your seatbelt and you feel powerless to solve your problems. If you feel like that within your own mind and to the way you relate to your own emotions, it doesn't feel very good. And it holds us back if we can't control our emotions. That's the fundamental thing. I mean, you think back, there was lots of kids in school that were smart, that ended up pumping gas or flipping burgers because they couldn't control their emotions. 
enough to focus their attention and do what they had to do. They had attitude. They had anger issues. They had shyness as a result of fear. But you guys are here because you have some degree of emotional intelligence, enough that you, you know, you jump through the hoops and here you are. And I commend you for it, truly. You're being the pilot. The pilot of your emotional experience, the pilot of your life, grabbing the yoke. And it's a different way to look at your life when you decide, I'm in control. I'm not going to allow my emotions to win. That's a hostile takeover of the consciousness by emotion. It's the horse running and the rider just squeezing onto the horn, holding on for dear life. We are in control of the horse if we act like it, if we believe that we can. Then anything's possible. Thank <laughs> you.